Hello, everyone. I would like to welcome you to our sixth session RSET webinar series, Satellite Observations and Tools for Fire Risk Detection and Analysis. My name is Melanie Follett Cook, and I'm a research scientist at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center in Washington, DC. I'm also a health and air quality trainer for the NASA RSET program. I'm gonna give you a quick introduction to our webinar series before we start session one. Fire is a global phenomenon. Many ecosystems benefit from fires, which clear out dead material, releasing trapped nutrients, and promoting new growth. But fire can also have negative consequences, such as loss of life and property, hazardous air quality, soil erosion, and water contamination. Fires can range in intensity from very large, like the Australian and California wildfires of 2019 and 2020, that transported smoke around the entire globe, to very small waste burning fires that are too small to be detected by satellites, yet can have significant impacts for the air people breathe. At NASA, we observe all aspects of fire, from examining vegetation and weather patterns that might increase the chances of fire or its severity, to detecting fires when they burn and forecasting smoke, to analyzing the areas burned by fires and their impacts on ecosystems and water quality. This training will introduce users to NASA tools and observations that can be used to analyze each stage of fire pre-fire, during fire, and post-fire. The Earth is a system made up of smaller subsystems, or spheres. The lithosphere, or land. The hydrosphere, water. The biosphere, life. And the atmosphere, air. Fire are a unique phenomena in that they change and are changed by each of these spheres. Here, I'll touch on a few examples, but we'll go into more detail throughout the webinar series. In the atmosphere, smoke particles can affect the Earth's energy budget through the scattering and absorption of radiation and by altering cloud properties and lifetimes. Fires are also a large and variable source of greenhouse gases, such as carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide, which can also affect the energy budget. The biosphere includes all life, human, plant, and animal. For humans, smoke from fires can degrade air quality, causing a variety of short and long-term health effects. The fine particles in smoke can get into your eyes and lungs where they can cause health problems such as burning eyes, runny nose, and illnesses such as bronchitis. Fine particles can also aggravate chronic heart and lung diseases like asthma and are even linked to premature deaths in people with these conditions. The economic impacts of fire include property loss, loss of businesses or tourism, and of course the increased costs relating to fighting fire. Many plants and animals have adapted to the presence and recurrence of fire. Some plant species going so far as to rely on fire to ensure seed release or germination. Fires also have biological, chemical, and physical effects on soil. Fires can remove vegetation, exposing the soil to water and wind and accelerating erosion. They can also be an important component of soil nutrient recycling because they reintroduce nitrogen and other nutrients back into the soil. In the hydrosphere, the onset of drought conditions can lead to increases in fire activity. Heavy rains after a fire can accelerate soil erosion, which transports soil, ash, and other debris to streams and rivers, degrading water quality. In extreme cases, these sudden losses of vegetation and erosion can lead to flooding and landslides. Fires burn with different intensities and frequency depending on the type and condition of their fuel or what they're burning. Different regions have different fuels and usually a mix of different fuels, as well as different land use practices. Because of this, it's useful to distinguish between different types of fires or fire regimes. 
We can distinguish between fire regimes by examining fuel types or what is burning, the seasonality of when fires occur, when does it burn, what's causing the fires to ignite, why did it burn, and the intensity or how strong or hot the fire is, how does it burn. A given region might experience all of these different types of fire, and we'll take a little, we'll talk a little bit more about them on the following slides. When you think of fires in your mind, you might think of huge forest fires, like the fires in Australia in 2019 and 2020, or the California fires in the United States in 2020. These are examples of wildfires, which are unplanned fires caused by lightning or by accident by humans or on purpose by humans or arson. These are in contrast to prescribed fires, which are intentionally set fires, usually for land management or to clear vegetation. The term wildland fire is used in the United States and describes both types. Wildfires tend to be highly variable from year to year, but tend to be most dangerous during the dry hot seasons when fires can spread more rapidly and be difficult to control. Deforestation fires are fires that are set as part of the process that converts tropical rainforests to land that can be used for ranching or farming. These fires are common in the Amazon and in areas like Indonesia. Tropical forests are cut and then dried for a month or so before being burned. These fires tend to peak during dry seasons and are entirely human driven. Forest wildfires or deforestation fires that burn forests are hotter and more intense and therefore are more easily detectable by satellite, something we'll talk about in detail later in this webinar series in session three. Wildfires that burn fuels like shrubs or grasses tend to be smaller and less hot, making them more challenging to detect from space. Next, we'll talk about agricultural fires and peat fires. Farmers use fires to clear away the remains of old crop fields, either before planting season to make way for new crops or after a growing season to return nutrients to the soil. The top and middle images show agricultural fires in Africa and Southeast Asia, but these agricultural fires really are present throughout all parts of the world. Flash and burn agriculture fires are also common and refer to fires that are set to clear vegetation from land that is not open for planting. All these fires tend to be smaller and lower in intensity and can therefore be more challenging to detect by satellite. In session four, we'll hear about how that can impact our ability to model smoke from these fires. Peat is a type of soil made up of an accumulation of decaying vegetation or other organic matter. The image shown here on the lower right shows peat fires burning in Siberia. When peat fires burn, they can actually burn underground and be very difficult to put out. This can lead to prolonged periods of burning and given the high carbon content of peat, prolonged periods of smoke. Peat fires tend to be more smoldering, burning at much lower temperatures, making them also extremely challenging to detect by satellite. In this webinar series, we won't talk a lot about this type of fire, but it should be noted they're a significant source of carbon from fires, and in the case of Siberia, can accelerate permafrost thaw. Now, I'm going to take a little step back and talk briefly about the NASA Applied Remote Sensing Training Program, or RSET. At RSET, our mission is to provide accessible, relevant, and cost-free training on remote sensing satellites, sensors, methods, and tools to increase the use of Earth observations in decision-making activities. RSET offers both in-person and online trainings at a variety of levels. This allows participants to learn remote sensing based on their level of experience and need. RSET offers trainings in the following application areas, disasters, health and air quality, land management, and water resources. 
Here are the faces behind the RCED program, many of which you'll hear during this webinar series. That's me in the top right. We'll also hear from several guest speakers. Because as we just heard, fires are a phenomena that touch every part of the Earth system. So it probably makes sense that this is actually the very first time that all members of the RCED team have collaborated on a webinar series. Sessions one and two will be hosted by the land and water teams and will focus on pre-fire conditions. Today in session one, they'll describe weather and climate conditions, soil and temperature anomalies and fire weather. Session two this Thursday, they'll cover fire risk and fuels mapping and landscape monitoring. Sessions three and four will be next week hosted by the land and air quality and health teams, and will focus on conditions during fire. Session three will concentrate on fire and smoke detection from satellite, and session four will describe how those observations are used in air quality and smoke forecasting. That's when you'll hear from me again. In the final week, sessions five and six will focus on post-fire conditions and will be hosted by the disasters, land, and water teams. Session five will cover fire impacts on soil moisture and runoff and landslides. Session six will describe burned area and burn severity mapping and post-fire vegetation regrowth. Throughout this webinar series, we'll show you a variety of cases to demonstrate the capabilities of the sensors and tools we'll cover. Whenever possible, we've tried to stick to the following specific cases to show you, our participants, how all of these pieces fit together to tell the story of a fire. The Western United States had a historic wildfire season in the late summer of 2020. More than 2.5 million acres burned in the state of California alone, reducing the air quality to hazardous levels for millions of people and resulting in pictures like the one in the lower left taken of San Francisco, California. Each year, the African continent contains 30 to 50% of all the area burned globally. The majority of these fires are human set agricultural fires that are used to clear vegetation. Fires in the savannas of Sub-Saharan Africa have become part of the ecosystem, used to return nutrients quickly to the soil in a region where regrowth is rapid. Hot and dry conditions in 2019 led to an intense fire season in Mexico, with 108 fires burning in 17 states as of May 14. Burning resulted in particularly poor air quality in Mexico City. This led officials to declare an environmental emergency, advising the 21 million residents of the Mexico City metropolitan area to stay indoors. Here, we list the overall training objectives for the webinar series. We hope by the end of this training, you, our participants, will understand terminology regarding the typing components of fire, climatic and biophysical conditions, pre, during, and post fire, the satellites and instruments used in conducting fire science, the applications of passive and active remote sensing for fires, how to visualize fire emissions and particulate matter, the use of tools for active fires, emissions, and burned areas, and how to acquire data for conducting analysis in a given study area. In today's session, we'll hear from Amita Mehta, Sean McCartney from the Disasters and Water Teams, and also from our guest speaker, Robert Field. Amita will now start session one. Thank you, Melanie. So we'll start with today's session and we'll focus on remote sensing and earth system model data relevant for pre-fire monitoring of weather, climate, and hydrologic conditions. So before we start, let's first define what we mean by weather and climate. So weather represents instantaneous atmospheric condition or current condition on say hourly or daily time scale, whereas climate represents time mean conditions averaged over longer time periods such as a month or a season, a year or a decade or even longer. 
So we will first talk about pre-fire climate conditions and later in this session Robert Field will talk more about fire weather conditions. We will start with some background on climate and wildfires, have a brief overview of relevant NASA remote sensing and modeling data products and data access tools, and then present case studies analyzing pre-fire conditions. Melanie has already described different types of fires, both natural and human induced. I will be uh, presenting a case study where we learn to monitor pre-fire climate variables associated with 2020 wildfire season in California. Wildfires result from a complex connection between weather and climate conditions and ecosystem processes. Numerous studies have indicated that fire frequency, spatial extent, and duration show a close association with climate variability on seasonal to interannual and decadal timescales. Some of these references are cited here and they are given at the end of this presentation. These two figures from Fasilo et al. What they show is that how El Nino can impact temperature changes and resulting changes in fire probability over North America, Australia, and South America. These two columns um, show 20th century temperature changes from European Center model, and this is US Community Earth System model. Uh, so these show how temperature changes related to El Nino and this one shows 21st century projection of temperature in CESM model. The bottom figures shows corresponding changes in probability in 20th and 21st century related to the temperature changes in fire probability. This study concludes that the intensification in temperature extremes over land regions and land atmosphere feedback are likely to play a significant role in resulting heat waves and wildfire frequency over these regions, continental regions. Climate change along with um, this variability is also considered responsible for increasing fire activities worldwide. Furthermore, this figure shows a feed feedback loop between climate and wildfire. Uh, increasing temperature due to climate change create drier conditions in forests, making more fuel available for fires. Then drier vegetation easily catches fire when sparks from either lightning or from human activities occur. And then fires, uh, they add carbon dioxide back to the atmosphere and that can lead to further increase in temperature. So this is how climate impacts fires and then fires feed back to climate change also. As shown in this figure, uh, controls on fires at various spatial and temporal scales depend on interannual to decadal climate regime, which impact wildfire activities or, um, uh, or fire weather over several days. And then finally, even to down to a few seconds, and you can see how spatial scale also changes here. Fire weather is characterized by a combination of temperature, precipitation, winds, and humidity uh, conducive to high uh, potential of the fire activities. So in addition to temperature, precipitation also influences fire activities. It is observed that the excessive precipitation during the growing season increases vegetation growth that become fuel for fire in the subsequent dry season. So pre-fire season rainfall and number of rainy days pre-fire and during fire seasons affect wildfire extent and severity. Precipitation patterns and amount also affect surface temperature and soil moisture which have impact on fire risk. This example shows how pre-fire soil moisture anomalies, which is departure from long-term mean soil moisture, help assess risk of wildfires. These figures from Sugmin et al. They show soil moisture as a function of aridity and temperature, five months and one month before fires. In, in, in uh, arid region, uh, wetter than normal soil moisture anomalies precede 
fires whereas in less arid region or humid region it's the other way drier than normal soil moisture anomalies precede fires this is likely due to precipitation anomalies in these areas and resulting higher or lower vegetation growth that controls fuel availability for fires so the examples shown here what they show is that monitoring temperature precipitation soil moisture humidity winds and vegetation on weather to climate time scale can help assess short to long term fire risk since topography also influences weather and climate that also is important for understanding fire risk now nasa remote sensing and earth system models provide these data from diurnal to multi year time scales and also provide forecast enabling pre fire risk assessment during fire monitoring and post fire impact assessment next i am going to focus on sources and tools to get the top 5 of these uh, variables on in particularly in pre uh, fire season uh, vegetation and topography will be covered in subsequent sessions so we will today focus mostly on these atmospheric and hydrologic parameters so this brings us to uh, data section remote sensing and modeling data um, of these five variables that i showed and how to access them we start with remote sensing based data sets first that is precipitation and soil moisture This table shows a summary of satellites and sensors for these data. Details of the satellites and sensors can be found in these earlier RSET webinars. Precipitation derived from combined TRIM, GPM and additional satellites provide data for more than 20 years at 1/10th of a degree resolution. Soil moisture from soil moisture active passive is available at 9 by 9 kilometers and 36 by 36 kilometers resolution this table shows summary of earth system models and data available from them including all weather and climate parameters such as precipitation temperature humidity winds and soil moisture uh, modern era retrospective analysis for research and application version 2 Goddard Earth Observing System version 5 and North American and Global Land Data Assimilation models they all provide uh, these data sets please note that all of them have varying special resolutions from NLDAS having 1/8 of a degree to 1 by 1 degree for GLDAS and in between for other models however they all have data sets which are longer than 20 years helpful in monitoring seasonal to longer term climate variations in the next few slides we will briefly point out main features of the satellites and models we just summarized we will use some of these data sources for analyzing pre fire climate conditions in the case studies today and robert field will use some of the same data sources for monitoring fire weather also some of the data will be used in subsequent sessions of this webinar focusing on pre during and post fire phases for analyzing vegetation and fire fuel conditions and also fire related impacts on air quality starting with global precipitation measurement mission gpm was launched in 2014 It was a follow-up mission to tropical rainfall measuring mission which was active between late 1997 to 2015 these two satellites use microwave imagers and precipitation radars to derive state of the art precipitation records covering both tropics and high latitude adequately the precipitation data product we we will use today is imerge version 6 This product is derived by combining TRIM and GPM data with other national and international constellation of satellites shown here. There are multiple versions of iMERGE with different data latency and also for different applications. The one we are going to use today is iMERGE version 6 final version. More information about this product can be found from this link. 
soil moisture active passive was launched relatively recently in 2015 but it provides high resolution global surface and root zone soil moisture derived from l band radiometer and this can be very useful for monitoring pre and post fire soil moisture and vegetation conditions starting with models Goddard Earth Observing System model has multiple model components and configuration options including atmospheric, oceanic and coupled model, also has atmospheric chemistry model and it provides near real time data as well as forecast data for up to 5 days. Surface weather data that snapshot is shown here is available every hour. MERA 2 that uses GEOS 5 output, model output, and blends with vast quantity of observational data from surface, aircraft, and satellites. As shown in this figure, in the recent time, more and more satellite data are being assimilated, bringing the atmospheric state in MERA closer to reality, especially improving hydrologic cycle in the model. More details about this can be found at this link. The next two modeling systems are land data assimilation systems. This one is for global domain and the second one is for North American region. Both these systems are land surface, water and energy balance models with assimilation of remote sensing data. Both use weather data forcing and surface radiation from various satellite and atmospheric model data sources and provide integrated outputs of soil moisture, evapotranspiration, runoff, and snow water equivalent. So both these models uh, provide the same outputs. Today, we will use GLDAS soil moisture to analyze pre-fire climate condition. This brings us to data access tools and how to access data sets that we just talked about. This table summarizes data tools for different uh, data sets. Um, iMERGE, MERA2, and ALDAS data are available from Giovanni, which is an online analysis and visualization tool, and Goddard Earth Science um, Data and Inter Information Service Tools, GES DISC. Uh, all, they are available from both these tools. SMAP data are available from APIERS, which is application for extracting and exploring analysis ready samples. And GEOS 5 has its own portal that provides weather analysis and forecast data. Today we are going to use um, Giovanni for most of our data access, but we are going to briefly review other tools. So GES DISC, this is recommended for bulk data download, and this is the interface Please note that for any of these web tools, NASA Earth Data login is required and one can register to NASA Earth Data at this link. So next, here's a brief overview of GES Disk. An example I'm using is MERA2 data. So you can search for data um, in this window and once you select the data, you will get list of data by the search string. You see that there are multiple MERA data. For example, I have chosen monthly mean time averaged temperatures here. Once you choose the data set, it provides option for downloading method and special and temporal uh, selection. So once you pick download method, it allows you to subset data using GES disk subsetter. Here you can refine date range I have just, for example, chosen August uh, 1st, 2020 to end of August. And you can pick a region, coordinates shown here are for California, but you can click on this link and there will be a map in which you can draw a box around your own region. Important feature of GS Disk is that it allows you to pick a single variable from a number of variables available in this data set. So for this, I have chosen just one variable that is 10 meter uh, temperature and I can just choose this vari uh, one variable from a list of drop down menu here. And the output format uh, here it is NetCDF. Once you select op the option, all the options and 
uh, hit this uh, get data button, you can get a list of URLs for all the files that you have chosen with the variables you have chosen. And then you can use either wget or curl to do bulk download of data. So in summary, GES disk um, is recommended for bulk download allows uh, special, temporal, and variable uh, extraction. Next tool is Giovanni. Uh, Giovanni is an online analysis and visualization. So it allows you to do analysis, look at it, and then download analyzed data rather than raw data. So here are some of the options. Uh, there are multiple analysis options. There is um, temporal selection. Uh, there is special um, extraction. Here you can draw a map, a box on a map, or you, on, by clicking on this symbol, you can select predefined shapes for U.S. states, countries in the world, and also watersheds of the world. So the, these are special temporal selections. Again, there is a keyword search here. And that allows you to type, say, iMerge or Mera or GLDAS here and comes up with data options. There are analysis options here that includes maps, um, various options, and time series. We are going to use today maps, especially for monthly and seasonal averages, and time series also for seasonal averages. There are other options, such as comparison of data set, the uh, vertical cross sections and some miscellaneous parameters. Once you pick all the parameters, you can plot data, you can view the plots and download data in various formats. So here is just a simple example of picking iMerge final that we are going to use today. Mera 2, we are going to use for climate analysis. So we are going to use 10 meter air temperature, relative humidity, uh, northward. So this is meridional wind and this is zonal winds. So these data we are going to use today from Giovanni. Uh, Mera 2, note here, has this link for file name convention. It's recommended that you view, look at this document to pick proper data that for your own use. Also note that these are three-dimensional data, some of them, and we are picking 1,000 hectopascal data, which is close to the surface. From GLDAS, we are going to use soil moisture content from 0 to 10 centimeter, and we're going to analyze that for pre-fire conditions. SMAP soil moisture data are available from APPEARS. This is the tool, and this is the link. This also is an interactive tool that allows special selection. Here you can upload your own shape file to extract data. There is temporal selection and there is product search and selection window. Once you select all the options, you can submit this. You can choose different data formats and geographical projection. And uh, you, once you submit the order, you will receive an email and you can download this data. So this tool also is useful for bulk download of data. Finally, GEOS 5 data portal is shown here. Uh, this is the weather map portal. Once you go there, you can get near real time and forecast data every hour. And this can be downloaded from uh, either FTP using HTTPS or as open app data. So you can visualize and animate weather data for global as well as regional domain, and you can download this data. So this is overall information about data and tools. Today, we will uh, use iMERGE, MERA2, and GLDAS data I mentioned for next case study. So now we will see a case study of pre-fire climate analysis for California focusing specifically on 2020 summer fire season. This was a very anomalous fire season with a um, large number of fire events and a large area influenced by um, fire. In this analysis, we will use some of the data sets and tools that we just talked about. As shown in this figure, 
it is well documented that there is an increasing trend in fire frequency in the western United States. This is between 1950 and 2017 and also on top of this you can see interannual variability of fire frequency in the western United States. Particularly in California, these data from firecalifornia.gov um, between 2008 and 2020 shows that fire frequencies uh, ranged from more than 6,000 to 9,200 and 2020 of course was one of the larger fire frequency year and the area influenced by fire in acres is hundreds of thousands to more than a million acres. For 2020, fire events uh, noted by this California fire activity site is more than 8,000 and more than 1 million uh, and 443k acres were influenced and this is to compare with five year average clearly um, much many more fire events and much larger area influenced by fire in 2020. Site here shows interactive map of fires that occurred in California every year and this is for 2020. So by clicking on any of the fire symbol locations on this map you can get more information about that fire event such as date, county, location and acres burn etc. Typically Fires in California occur between May and October, November, but frequency generally increases after July, that is in summer. So based on uh, this map for 2020, uh, what we saw is that there was an increase in fire activity in Northern California in August of 2020, specifically between 18th and 23rd of August in 2020. Just to show where this fire activity increased, we are showing an animation here. This is from NASA MODI sensor showing daily fire location. And this is from site, it's called NASA Worldview. And you can see that this region between Eureka and Redding, here is where there was increase in fire activity in August, particularly between 18 to 23rd of August. You will learn more about MODIS and Worldview uh, in Session 2 and Session 3 of this webinar series. This is just to orient ourselves that this is the region that we, we are looking at where there was a large uh, number of fires occurred in August. So geographically, this region um, is in mountainous region as you can see it's Klamath Mountains and it is also covered by forest. So here is where there was increase in fire activity in August. So what we're going to do here is first look at long-term climate conditions in California. So we'll look at mean conditions and we will focus on pre-fire seasons that is winter and spring season uh, which is preceding summer season when fires occurred. And then we will look at how 2020 pre-fire seasons were different that indicate potential for increased fire activity in subsequent summer season. So we'll start with looking at area average time series of temperature, precipitation and soil moisture. So in this figure, what you see is 2001 to 2020 area averaged MERA2 temperature, this is 10 meter above surface, GPM IMERGE precipitation and GLDA soil moisture from surface to 10 centimeter of depth. And all different colors show different seasons. So this is winter, this is spring, summer and autumn. So this is December, January, February, March, April, May, June, July, August and so forth. So what you see here and it is well known that California has a Mediterranean type of climate 
and so there are wet and cold winters so this blue season you can see higher rainfall lower temperature warm and dry summer so th this is the summer month as you can see it's very dry and very hot and there is significant interannual variability in precipitation and also in soil moisture these two arrows mark recent El Nino years which show below normal uh, precipitation uh, averaged over California. Next, what we see is a long term mean. This is 20 year mean maps of temperature. So it, this is from 2001 to 2020 average. Uh, and what you see here is map of winter season temperature and spring season temperature both are pre-fire seasons so what you can see clearly is that the pattern is pretty much the same in both seasons winter being colder than spring season and uh, eastern central and southern california are much warmer than this mountainous region in north and also in the eastern part in both seasons if you look at precipitation, this is from iMERGE for the two seasons, that is spring, uh, winter and spring, you can clearly see that uh, much larger rainfall during um, winter, almost 40 to 50 percent higher than spring season. Again, pattern is somewhat similar that uh, much drier or less rainfall in southern and eastern part but in this, this central valley region and in the northern part there is a larger amount of precipitation this is the general climatologic condition if you look at soil moisture from GLDAS again for winter and spring in general you can see that uh, it's much drier in southern part of the state and northern part of the state has larger moisture amount, soil moisture amount. So here now we see how the 2020 winter and spring seasons were different from the normal climate conditions. So we used Giovanni to download all the data and then now use QGIS to calculate anomaly maps for 2020 spring, winter and spring seasons. So the top shows temperature, precipitation, and soil moisture anomalies for winter 2020, and the bottom shows the same for spring season of 2020. If you look at the winter season, almost everywhere in California, uh, except for this small region, temperatures were warmer than normal, showing positive anomalies, and precipitation was drier or less than normal deficit was shown. So this winter was much drier compared to climatology and much warmer. Also, if you look at soil moisture, um, in Northern California, there is deficit of soil moisture compared to normal soil moisture. And so these magnitudes are much larger in Northern California. If you go to spring season, this warming uh, trend continues in spring season also in Northern California and similarly much drying or deficit of rainfall in that part of state also consistent with this deficit of soil moisture. So based on this now we show here climate indicator for potential fire risk in subsequent summer season. So what we've done is shown areas where temperature is warmer than normal, precipitation and soil moisture are uh, less than normal. So it shows warming and drying. And so the region shown in yellow show that in, in this all these areas, there is potential of increased fire because of the climate conditions. Now, it is important to note that along with climate conditions, um, weather also matters, fire weather, and uh, availability of vegetation for fuel, that is very important. Here, we have not considered that part. Next week, we will be looking at vegetation um, or fuel availability 
availability for fire in California for this case. Um, and then these maps can be further refined to show uh, fire risk. But just based on the climate conditions showing warmer and drier conditions, these are the areas where you would expect uh, increased fire activities in sub subsequent summers. So we saw that pre-fire seasonal climate regime in 2020 was anomalously warm and dry. In this figure, we show three hourly weather data from Mera 2. So this is for August 2020, and this is for the uh, region where fire activities increased in August. So this shows temperature, relative humidity, and wind speed. The, this is this period fire period is marked here um, from 18 to 23rd of August and what it shows is that just before fire you see warmer temperatures drying of atmosphere because of less relative humidity and relatively um, milder wind but then the wind speed increases as fire uh, fires start and this could be the influence of fire itself also, according to California Fire Information Portal, these events, they started from lightning spark. So we looked at iMERGE data for August. This is half hourly precipitation in millimeters per hour. What you see here, there's this, there is a spike in rainfall. Here's the only event you see before the fire started. And the rainfall itself is minuscule, but this shows possibility of having a lightning spark, which may have triggered this uh, fire. So what we saw here is um, that um, both climate and weather data are useful in monitoring fire activities. So this concludes the California August 2020 fire case study. And now, uh, Sean McCartney will present a case study in Zambia where he will show how climate engine can be used for pre-fire pre risk analysis. Thank you, Amita. For our second case study on pre-fire conditions, we'll turn to the country of Zambia in southern Africa. Zambia is a landlocked country in Southern Africa, consisting mainly of high plateaus with some hills and mountains drained by the Zambezi and Congo rivers. The country lies at the continental divide of Africa with the Congo River draining to the Atlantic Ocean and the Zambezi River draining to the Indian Ocean. The Zambezi River flows over the 1.6 kilometer wide Victoria Falls in the Southwest and bordering the north of the country is Lake Tanganyika, the longest freshwater lake in the world. The majority of the country lies between 1,000 and 1,600 meters above sea level, which has a moderating effect on the country's tropical, wet, and dry climate. Zambia has three distinct seasons, a warm dry season from April through early August, a hot dry season from mid-August through October, and a hot wet season from November through March. The combination of extensive burning late in the dry season, continued population growth, wood extraction, and agricultural expansion have resulted in a significant increase in the rate of deforestation and environmental degradation occurring in Zambia. The presence of fire adapted plants and paleoecological studies indicate that fire has been used by humans in this landscape for millennia, and as such is culturally ingrained and has helped to shape much of the existing Zambian landscape. Dominated by vast tracts of fire-prone vegetation, including woodland savannas and grasslands. Fire is a readily available and inexpensive tool that rural populations in Zambia can utilize to participate in a multitude of traditional activities such as clearing vegetation for agriculture, improving pastures for grazing, hunting, and stimulating the growth of non-timber forest products. 
Fire can be an effective management tool when applied judiciously and therefore should not be excluded as a tool from those communities that have traditionally used it to hunt, cultivate crops, and non-timber forest products, and to manage forests. Studies by Sikandi in 2013 and Hollingsworth et al. in 2015 have shown that approximately 25%, or an average of 188,000 square kilometers of Zambia's total land area burnt annually between 2007 and 2012. To better characterize fires in Zambia, we will use the Global Wildfire Information System, or GWIS, as it's known by its acronym. GWIS brings together existing information sources at the regional and national level to provide a comprehensive evaluation of fire regimes and effects. GWIS also provides tools to support operational wildfire management from national to global scales. In part two of the webinar series, we will show a demonstration of GWIS for land cover and fuels in sub-Saharan Africa. Today we'll highlight some of the features of GWIS using Zambia as the case study, but the same assessment can be done for any other country or region on the planet. One of the features of GWIS is it provides an overview for your country of interest, including total surface area, population, and land cover types. Land cover maps are essential for analyzing risk and impacts from fire conditions, and GWIS uses the European Space Agency's Climate Change Initiative land cover maps for their dashboard. They can be used to map forested areas, croplands, and grasslands in Zambia in reference to conditions pre, during, and post fire. The GWIS country profile provides both a chart and map to visualize land cover. The link at the top of the slide will take you to the country overview for Zambia. Another feature of the GWIS dashboard is it provides country-specific charts for a variety of fire parameters. These charts can be customized to a single year or for a range of years based on one study period of interest. The current range for multi-year charts is from 2002 to 2019. One can use the charts to understand yearly burned area and number of fires, average fire season over the study period, yearly burned area by land cover, average monthly burned area, as well as average monthly fire size per year. Each of the charts can be downloaded from the GWIS dashboard. The link at the top of this slide will take you to the GWIS website to explore more. On the slide, we've provided a couple examples from Zambia. On the left of the slide, the chart shows the average monthly burned area during the fire season, along with the number of fires in Zambia from 2002 to 2019. On the right of the slide, the chart shows the average monthly burned area by land cover from 2002 to 2019. Having quick access to statistics on the seasonality, intensity, and distribution of fires will help with an assessment of your study area and prepare for further analysis. Another feature of the GWIS dashboard is the ability to visualize country and regional maps for different fire parameters. Users have the option to narrow their selection to any month and year of burned area from 2002 to 2019. One can also select an individual year for cumulative burned area. On this slide, it shows a map for the frequency of fires from 2002 to 2019. When combined with a land cover map, one can see which regions and land cover types have experienced fires at varying occurrences over the given 18 years. This information allows one to understand which forested areas, grasslands, and croplands have experienced the most fire occurrences in Zambia. This same assessment can be scaled to regional and global scales as well. On this slide, GWIS is showing the cumulative burned area in Zambia for the year 2019. As we saw in earlier charts, the dry season, 
from May through October, is when the majority of the area in the country is burned. We encourage you to go to the GWIS website and explore for your own region of interest. In part two, we will have a demonstration of GWIS to show more how you can use this online tool to understand fire in any country or region on the planet. Still using Zambia as our case study, we're going to showcase Climate Engine for on-demand processing of satellite and climate data via a web browser and how it can be used to assess pre-fire climate, weather, and hydrology conditions. Climate Engine uses Google's Earth Engine with a customized user interface created by the University of Idaho, the Desert Research Institute, and Google for anomaly mapping, creating time series and statistical summaries, and allowing users to share map or time series results with web URL links. It allows users to bring algorithms to the data in a cloud environment, overcoming computational limitations of big data for use in real-time monitoring. Climate Engine is fully customizable for spatial and temporal analyses and provides a comprehensive set of variables that provide early warning indicators of climate impacts for fire, drought, agriculture, and other applications. One can select from the Make Map tab for quickly visualizing and analyzing variables for remote sensing, including the Landsat archive, the MODIS archive, and Sentinel-2 archive. One can also make maps for climate and hydrology using datasets from CHIRPS, MERA2, PRISM, GRIDMET, SNOWDAS, and FLDAS, to name but a few. All the datasets are visualized as a map layer on Google Map. We encourage you to use the link provided and explore Climate Engine for yourself. By choosing the Make Graph tab at the top of Climate Engine, you have the option to create a time series from either a point location or as an average over a spatial region. The same remote sensing and climate variables provided under the Make Map tab are also available as a graph with several options for statistical analysis. One also has the option to select a date range from the dataset to perform processing upon. The example shown on this slide is a native time series of Pentad precipitation using CHIRP's data, which is a gridded rainfall product for trend analysis and seasonal drought monitoring. In this example, we've spatially subset the time series to the country of Zambia and selected mean precipitation as an output. This takes the mean precipitation for all of Zambia every pentad, or five days, and displays the result on a graph, which can be downloaded or shared as a URL web link. Exploring the graph, we can see a clear seasonality of wet and dry seasons with precipitation starting in October each year and ending in April. The computational ability to create a time series from Pentad precipitation for on-demand processing via a web browser in a matter of minutes is a very powerful tool and can be used to understand the climatology of a study area, highlighting wet and dry years. In this slide, We've narrowed the date range to a specific year, 2020, for Pentad precipitation from CHIRPS. We've kept the native time series analysis to the country of Zambia. A native time series looks at the raw data over a specific time period. The same time series analysis can be done for any year from 1981 to present to compare annual variability in precipitation. Doing so helps to characterize the timing of rainfall events throughout the rainy season and contrast years of drought with years of non-drought. Another option Climate Engine provides is creating a summary time series of remote sensing or climate data. A summary time series allows one to compare yearly values computed over a season or a year, such as winter or annual averages. The example on this slide shows the same pentad precipitation from CHIRPS 
for the southern water year, which is April through March. By using the time series of available CHIRPS precipitation data, we can contrast the average precipitation for Zambia from one year to the next, quickly contrasting wet and dry years from the average total precipitation. We've also placed circles around extreme dry years, showing how they coincide with El Nino years. Understanding the connection between El Nino and below average precipitation in Southern Africa is important for food security, drought mitigation, and fire preparation. The following slides show the results of using the Make Map tab in Climate Engine for quickly visualizing and analyzing variables for remote sensing, climate, and hydrology. In this example, we used CHIRP's Pentad precipitation data to calculate, calculate <clears throat> the Standardized Precipitation Index, or SPI, for Zambia during the wet season from October 2018 through April 2019. The Standardized Precipitation Index, or SPI, is a widely used index to characterize meteorological drought on a range of timescales. The SPI values can be interpreted as the number of standard deviations by which the observed anomaly deviates from the long-term mean. In this case, SPI is comparing the wet season from 2018 to 2019 to every other wet season throughout the data record, ranging from 1981 to 2020. We can see much of southern Zambia shows large deficits in precipitation, shown in red, compared to other wet seasons from 1981 to 2020. One can also map soil moisture variability in an area of interest. In this example, we selected data from the Famine Early Warning System Network Land Data Assimilation System, or FLDAS, to analyze surface soil moisture during Zambia's wet season from October 2018 to April 2019. In this case, we specified Climate Engine to calculate the difference from average conditions to understand soil moisture anomalies for a specific wet season. In many parts of the planet, there is a strong correlation between the timing and location of low soil moisture conditions and an increase in fires. From the map, we can see in red that much of southern Zambia shows deficits in surface soil moisture compared to other wet seasons from 1981 to 2020. In this slide, we're still using FLDAS data, but mapping evapotranspiration during the same wet season from 2018 to 2019. Evapotranspiration is the sum of evaporation from the land surface plus transpiration from plants. We can see much of Zambia shows lower evapotranspiration compared to other wet seasons from 1981 to 2020, indicating drier soil conditions and less evaporation of water from plant leaves. It's another parameter in assessing drought conditions and pre-fire analysis in many parts of the planet. Another way to use Climate Engine for pre-fire analysis is to analyze remotely sensed data products from the MODIS instrument on board the Terra and Aqua satellites. In this example, we've used Climate Engine to map the NDVI percent difference from average conditions for the wet season from October 2018 to April 2019. The map shows anomalies in vegetation greenness in central and southern Zambia when compared to other wet seasons from 2000 to 2019. It's an indication of how stressed vegetation is during any given year. Another example of using remotely sensed data for pre-fire assessment is to map MODIS land surface temperature for one study area. In this example, we're mapping land surface temperature for the dry season in Zambia, which ranges from May to September, and in this case, we're highlighting the year 2019. Climate Engine provides different ways of calculating land surface temperature when creating a map. 
you have the option to map the average values over a specific time period, the differences from average conditions, the slope of the trend, and the correlation of trend. Mapping what areas have a higher land surface temperature compared to the average for any given season can inform areas at higher risk for a fire. Another data set Climate Engine provides is the Burned Area Index derived from the MODIS instrument. In this example, we've used Climate Engine to map burned area index anomalies for the 2019 dry season in Zambia. The map is showing differences in the burned area index compared to the average burned area index for dry seasons in Zambia from 2000 to 2019. As mentioned earlier, Climate Engine provides the ability to download or share results instead of processing entire data archives locally. Maps can be downloaded as raster files in GeoTIFF format, and graphs can be downloaded as PNG, JPEG, PDF, CSV, or XLS files. You can also share a link to the last successful map result from Climate Engine when collaborating with colleagues. Climate Engine is fully customizable for spatial and temporal analysis, providing a comprehensive set of variables that provide early warning indicators of climate impacts for fire. I'll now hand the presentation over to my colleague Robert Field to discuss fire danger. In this part of the webinar about pre-fire conditions, we'll introduce basic concepts of fire danger, starting with some definitions and concepts and moving to specific tools and data products that you can use. Um, a lot of these data products bring together the individual data sources that we've uh, seen from Amita, for example, tying them into integrated indices that can be used to characterize fire danger. There will be examples using the data for fire events in 2019 over Mexico and for 2020 in the Western US. Let's start with two definitions using a glossary from the UN Food and Agriculture Organization's forestry program, the link to which is in the title of this slide. Fire danger, is a general term used to express an assessment of both fixed and variable factors of the fire environment that determine the ease of ignition, rate of spread, difficulty of control, and fire impact. In other words, whether a fire can start and how it will move. Fire danger rating is a component of a fire management system that integrates the effects of selected fire danger factors into one or more qualitative indices of current protection needs. Fire danger rating systems were developed from ad hoc tools to provide a uniform starting point for fire management agencies to prepare for and respond to fire. The picture on the right is a public fire danger rating sign from the Hoi Nam Dong National Park in Northern Thailand. Signs like this are common throughout the world where fire danger rating systems have been established. During this part of the webinar, we will learn about the systems, the data used to set the arrows, arrows on these signs, and where you can get this data for anywhere in the world. In practical terms, fire danger is about tracking static and dynamic elements of the fire environment, which influence if a fire could start and how it might spread. First, topography. Topography is a static part of fire danger. All else being equal, fires spread faster uphill as the slope bends the fuel toward the flame, preheating those fuels. Fuels on sun-facing slopes also dry out faster than in the shade. Fuels are both a static and dynamic part of fire danger. For example, fires start more easily in fine fuels such as forest litter and grass. It is harder for fires to spread in live or matted grass than in standing dead grass. There's more fuel available to burn and produce smoke in forests compared to grass. Coniferous trees tend to be more flammable than broadleaved trees. 
Fire behavior also depends on fuel structure. For example, the space between trees, the continuity of the landscape, or if there are ladder fuels that allow a fire to spread from the surface into the tree crown. The two pictures show examples of fires in different fuels and on different terrain. On the top is an experimental savanna fire in South Africa's Kruger National Park. This is a low intensity fire in light fuels spreading on flat terrain. The bottom picture is of an experimental fire in Canada's Banff National Park. This is a larger, higher intensity fire in coniferous pine forests spreading uphill and producing more smoke. The last and most dynamic element of fire danger is weather. Weather controls the fuel moisture, the moisture content of dead fuels and influences the moisture content of live fuels. Alongside topography and fuels, the wind determines the direction and speed of a fire's spread. Those are the three basic elements of fire danger. Definition-wise, fire danger is different, distinct from fire threat or fire hazard, which include values at risk, such as the potential for lost lives, property, or negative effects on soils, water, or air quality. Fire danger rating systems are also distinct from fire occurrence prediction systems, which capture ignition sources, namely lightning and fires caused by people. In general, fire danger rating systems are more relevant for wildland and deforestation fires compared to, say, agricultural fires. Around the world, there are simple and complex fire danger rating systems. Here are three examples. Starting with the simplest, the crossover concept rule of thumb is an ad hoc way of identifying dangerously dry conditions. The situation is bad when the temperature in degrees Celsius is higher than the relative humidity. This idea developed from the experience of firefighters in North America. The Nesterov index was developed in Russia in the 1940s. The index goes up each day depending on the difference between the temperature and the dew point, uh, which is a measure of moisture, and is set to zero if it rains more than three millimeters. The US National Fire Danger Rating System is more complex. The NFDRS characterizes potential fire starts and behavior for 40 different US fuel types. It requires hourly observations of temperature, humidity, wind speed, precipitation, solar radiation, and a user-determined state of weather. And it can also be used to predict the, the behavior of individual fires. Regardless of their complexity, all fire danger rating systems have a weather component. The Canadian Fire Weather Index System is an intermediate complexity fire danger rating system. It is an accounting system to track the moisture content of different general classes of dead fuels paired with simple models of fire behavior. There are different indices capturing each. It requires daily measurements of surface temperature, relative humidity, wind speed, and precipitation and it is designed to produce a maximum amount of information from a minimum amount of data. Because of its modest data requirements and adaptability, it is the most widely used fire danger rating system in the world. Different indices have been adopted and calibrated for local fire environments, ranging from the boreal forests of Alaska, to the dry forests of Southern Europe, to the tropical forests of Fiji. The FWI system was formalized in Canada in the 1970s based on research that began in the 1930s. The tables on the right were used until recently by forest rangers and fire towers with simple weather in instruments to track the fire danger each day. The FWI system has three moisture codes. The fine fuel moisture code or FFMC is a numerical rating of the moisture content of litter and other cured fine fuels. This code indicates the relative ease of ignition and flammability of fine fuel. It is commonly used as an indicator for fire starts. The Duff Moisture Code, or DMC, is a numerical rating of the average moisture content of loosely compacted organic layers of moderate depth. This code indicates fuel consumption in moderate duff layers in medium-sized woody material. The drought code, or DC, is a numerical rating of the average moisture content of deep, compact organic layers. 
This code indicates seasonal drought effects on forest fuels and the amount of smoldering in deep duff layers and large logs. All three moisture codes are based on simple empirical models with a drying phase and a wetting phase. They are not designed to capture live fuel mo moisture content in, for example, tree canopies or green grass. They are only meant to track the moisture content in dead fuels. Next, the FWI system has three fire behavior indices. The initial spread index, ISI, is a numerical rating of the expected rate of fire spread. It combines the effects of wind and FFMC on rate of spread, but excludes the influence of variable quantities of fuel. Again, the FWI system is a weather only system. The buildup index, or BUI, is a numerical rating of the total amount of fuel available for combustion that combines the DMC and DC. The final fire weather index, or FWI component, is a numerical rating of fire intensity that combines ISI and BUI. It's suitable as an over, overall index of fire danger and is often used to set fire danger rating signs for the public. And for reference, the FWI component tracks closely with the burning index of the US National Fire Danger Rating System. This chart uh, just shows how the weather data flow into each of the moisture codes and behavior indices. Each day's moisture codes are calculated from the previous day's moisture codes and then from today's weather. The behavior indices are calculated from today's moisture codes and today's wind speed. By comparing the FWI values to fires under different conditions, decision aids can be developed. The pictures on the left show the FWI for fires with different fire behavior, all in a standard jack pine fuel type. The low intensity surface fire in the top left corner occurred when the FWI was nine, indicating moist conditions and low wind speeds. The high intensity crown fire on the right occurred when the FWI was 34, indicating dry conditions and high winds. These distinctions are used to create decision aids, an example of which is shown on the right, which describe the potential fire behavior and level of fire suppression difficulty. Decision aids and fire danger classes in different regions around the world will depend on the fuels, firefighting capacity, and values at risk in the fire environment. And so here are two examples uh, of these from other agencies in other parts of the world. In Costa Rica, the fire weather index component of the FWI system is used as a general indicator of fire danger. The National System of Conservation Areas uses daily weather data to calculate the FWI and make maps in the geographic information system to distinguish between regions of low and high fire danger in relation to the network of protected areas, which are also shown on the map. On March 3rd of this year, there was high and extreme fire danger in the Northwest, but low and moderate fire danger across the protected areas in the highlands. On the other side of the world in Indonesia, different FWI components are used for different aspects of fire danger. The fine fuel moisture code is used to track the potential for human caused fire starts in light surface fuels, such as tall alang alang grass. The drought code component, by contrast, is used to track the moisture content of peat fuels in drained swamps and is used as an indicator for smoke potential. The drought code map on the left is produced each day by the Indonesian Agency for Meteorology, Climatology, and Geophysics using weather station data and satellite precipitation data. This is also for March 3rd of 2021, which is during the rainy season over most of the country. The drought code is mostly low, indicating that peat fuels are too wet to burn, which is typically the case. During dry, drier than normal dry seasons, the DC can exceed 350, considered the extreme threshold, and fires can escape underground into dry peat and burn continuously until the return of the monsoon. Operationally, this information is used to identify areas with the potential for heavy smoke production, where prevention and preparedness measures should be focused. Other agencies, such as the Ministry of Environment and Forestry, also use the FWI system at a local level, using data from weather stations to set fire danger signs at district offices. 
Not all regions have established fire danger rating systems or publicly available fire danger data. The Global Fire Weather Database, or GFWED, is a small ensemble of FWI calculations designed, for example, so that people can make these types of maps for anywhere in the world. The weather inputs come from NASA weather forecast models, rain gauges, and satellite precipitation, some of which we heard in earlier parts of this pre-fire webinar. The highest resolution version at a tenth of a degree is calculated from NASA iMERGE precipitation data and is available in near real time and historically since 2001. There are also lower resolution versions which, which start in 1981. And these data are publicly available as daily and monthly NetCDF files. Uh, GFWED data are held, and you can find them at the NASA Center for Climate Simulation data portal, uh, the link for which is in the slide. The Na and I'll just mention that the NASA GIS Panoply soft software is useful for making quick maps from these NetCDF files. Up-to-date global maps can also be viewed at the European Commission Joint Research Center Global Wildfire Information System alongside FWI maps from the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecasts. Up-to-date global maps can also be viewed at the World Resources Institute Resource Watch Portal alongside land cover and values at risk layers. So here's an example of how the GFWED data can be used to study a recent fire event. It shows the fire weather index, how, or it shows how the fire weather index evolved each week over southern Mexico from November 2018 through June 2019. In May 2019, there was an outbreak of fires in the southwest that sent a lot of smoke to Mexico City. The map animation on the left shows the average weekly FWI and terra modis active fires with FWI categories from the Global Wildfire Information System. The chart on the right shows these values over time for Guerrero State where there was the most fire. So watch as the fire activity increases with higher FWI from the beginning to the peak of the dry season and then ends with the onset of the wet season. Over Guerrero State, there is no fire activity during November and December 2018 when the FWI was less than 20. There was scattered fire activity through January and February 2019 as the FWI climbed above 40. In mid-March, the FWI was persistently extreme and widespread fires broke out, burned through April, and peaked at the end of May. The FWI and fire activity dropped sharply at the beginning of June with the onset of the rainy season. In this case, the FWI climbs quickly in the absence of rain because of the high temperatures. This type of analysis shows how the FWI system can be adopted locally. An FWI greater than 60 is associated with severe outbreaks of fire. This number will be different in other regions around the world and is, and is a higher threshold than, for example, the FWI of 34 we saw in the decision aid pictures from Canada, or for the fire danger rating sign in Thailand, where the extreme FWI threshold is 28. The differences in the threshold are related primarily to vegetation differences and human activity. We can also see from the maps that the high FWI is a necessary but not sufficient condition for fire. There were areas of extreme FWI over the arid regions further north, but little fire acti activity because there is less vegetation to burn and fewer sources of ignition. We'll hear more about these types of vegetation uh, that these fires burned in and in the smoke transport to, to Mexico City in later webinars. This just shows the average monthly FWI in May 2019 in a longer term context. The FWI was twice as high as the 2001 to 2019 May average over much of Mexico. The FWI was also high over Northeast Colombia and Western Venezuela, but anomalously low elsewhere. These types of maps are easy to make from the monthly GFWED files using the Panoply software. This map was created from just two files, for example, uh, which are easy to download from the NCCS data portal. GFWED also has short eight-day FWI forecasts for the whole world. 
These are calculated in the same way as the other FWI data, but using forecasted weather data from NASA GMAO's GEOS-5 weather forecast model, which we've heard about and will hear about in subsequent parts of the webinar. The top panel shows the daily observed FWI and Terra Modis active fire counts over Guerrero State from January through June of 2019. This is similar to the, to the time series animation before with the severe fire outbreak in April and May 2019 occurring as the FWI was greater than 60. The FWI forecasts are only as good as the underlying weather forecasts. To evaluate them, the, bottle, the bottom panel shows the forecasts of the FWI, but with a color coding. The bottom row is the same as the FWI line in the top panel. Each row above is the forecast of that FWI at longer lead times. So a perfect forecast would appear as a vertical line with the same color. The lower lead time rows tend to be in better agreement with the bottom row. You can think of how a weather forecast for two to three days is usually pretty good, but gets less accurate for any longer. Over, over Guerrero, the FWI forecasts have a slight high bias at longer lead times, but tend to anticipate changes in the FWI, at least from week to week. For comparison, these are the same plots, but for January through June of 2018. Looking at the top panel, during March and April, there was enough periodic rain to keep the FWI below 60 and to suppress widespread fire activity. Heavy rain at the beginning of May led to a quiet finish to the fire season, unlike in 2019. These differences from 2019 are well captured by the forecast. For example, the rain event in mid-April and the season ending rain event in early May. Lastly, for Mexico, GFWED data can also be used to examine longer term relationships between weather and fire. These are also for Guerrero State. The scatter plot on the left shows the relationship between average May precipitation and total Terra Modis active fire accounts for each year between 2001 and 2020, with the year indicated by the two digit number. Unsurprisingly, there is a negative relationship between precipitation and fire activity less rain, more fire. If we do the statistics, May precipitation explains 40% of the variation in Modis fire activity. The scatter plot on the right shows a tighter positive relationship to the fire weather index. May FWI explains 66% of the variation in fire activity. The FWI does better than the precipitation alone primarily because of its memory. Through its accounting system, the FWI in May will capture if it was hot and dry in March and April, and hence whether fuels have dried out more. About a third of the variability in fire activity remains unexplained. This is due to other factors such as vegetation differences, ignition sources, and firefighting. But compared to many other regions, including in the US, the FWI explains a fairly high proportion of the year-to-year -year variability in fire activity over Guerrero. You can see how this relationship between fire and FWI compares other um, fire prone parts of the world in the Abatza glue et al paper from 2019 uh, that I referred to in the slide. Here's a more recent example, the bad 2020 fire season over the Western US where records were broken in California, Oregon, and Colorado. This animation shows the weekly FWI and MODIS fire progression from, from June through October. The ad hoc FWI categories are also from the Global Wildfire Information System. Again, if you're familiar with the US National Fire Danger Rating System, the FWI tracks closely with its burning index. As with Mexico, there is little fire activity where the FWI is less than 20, with varying degrees of fire as the FWI increases above that. Blank areas show where the FWI calculations have shut down either because of snow or cold temperatures. They'll start up again the next fire season with an adjustment for whether it was a dry or snowy winter. The time series on the right shows the FWI and Terra Modis active fire counts over Western Oregon from the blue box on the map. The FWI increased steadily through June and July, staying consistently above 30 through August. 
In the second week of September, there's a sharp increase in fire accounts. This corresponds to some of Oregon's largest fires in the past 30 years. The Beachy Creek and Lion's Head fires merged, for example, to, pr to burn a combined area of 398,000 acres. The sharp increase in the FWI was due to the buildup of dry conditions over the summer and a high wind event on September 8th, which drove the spread of the large fires. This shows the FWI forecasts for 2019 over the whole of the US Pacific Northwest, meaning Oregon and Washington, as defined by the US National Interagency Fire, Fire Center. The top panel shows the FWI and Terramotus active fire accounts for the whole year. The FWI remained below 30 for most of the summer. There was some fire in late July and early August, but overall it was a quiet fire year. This was because of substantial rain in early May and mid-August. On the bottom, we see that the May precipitation was well forecast a week before, whereas the August precipitation was well forecast around five days before. This shows the same FWI data over the Pacific Northwest, but for 2020. The top panel shows the FWI increase through July and August and the widespread fire outbreak in early September in Oregon, corresponding to the dry conditions and high winds. The FWI forecasts locked in on these conditions about five days before and on generally high fire danger conditions a week before along with rain events later in the month and, and into October that ended the fire season. These examples show how different weather elements, dryness and wind, combine to drive wildfire, how they were captured by the FWI system, and differences in how the weather part of fire danger can be forecast. So some take home points for this whole section of the webinar are, that the fire weather index thresholds will be different for different parts of the world. They depend on local factors such as vegetation and human activity. Similarly, fire weather can explain much of the variation in fire activity, but vegetation and human activity also play key roles. Uh, and lastly, the Global Fire Weather Database is publicly available and can be used as a starting point to understand the role of weather in local fire environments. Here are some resources that might be useful. The FAO has a glossary of wildland fire management terms, which is useful in thinking about fire danger in different parts of the world with different fire environments and in relation to operational fire management. The Canadian Forest Service made an introductory FWI video in the mid 1990s. It's 22 minutes long and goes into more technical detail than I've provided here. Some of the material is specific to Canada, but much of it is generally applicable. Global Fire Weather Database data and MATLAB code are described on the NASA GIS website, which also has access instructions. And if you want to do your own FWI calculations, there's also code available in six different programming languages from the Canadian Forest Service. Uh, if you want to do this, you can get weather data uh, from a global network of stations from the NOAA National Centers for Environmental Information Integrated Surface Database. And I'll just say lastly that similar products for the US to those shown here are available from the Climate Toolbox for Wildfire. And this also includes US National Fire Danger Rating System products. And lastly, here are some useful papers to look at if you're interested in learning more about fire danger in the fire weather index system. The DeGroote et al. 2015 book chapter describes fire danger rating concepts, applications, and different systems around the world. The Field 2020 paper is the most recent, recent GFWED reference comparing reanalysis and weather station FWI calculations and a global forecast evaluation for 2018. The Moore 2020 review paper puts fire danger rating in the context of global fire management research. The Pedinari and Chubieco 2020 review paper provides a broader review of fire danger rating with satellites, including work to retrieve fuel moisture directly. And lastly, again, the Abatsegu et al. 2018 is a good baseline analysis of where in the world the FWI system works well. Thanks, and now I'll hand this back to Sean before our question and answer session.
Thanks, Robert. We will now transition to the question and answer portion of today's webinar. Please enter your questions in the question and answer box. We will answer them in the order they were received. We will post the question and answer document to the training website following the conclusion of the webinar. For those interested in a certificate of completion, there will be three homework assignments throughout the course of the six part training. Answers must be submitted via Google Form, which can be accessed from the training page on the RSET website. The due date for all three homework assignments is June 8th, 2021. This is two weeks after the close of the webinar series. A certificate of completion will be awarded to those who attend all live webinars and complete the homework assignment by the deadline of June 8th. You will receive a certificate approximately two months after the completion of the course from Marinas Martin. Contact information for all of today's trainers is provided below. We've also provided links to the training page, the RSET website, and to social media. We encourage you to follow us on Twitter to stay informed about upcoming trainings and events. And wonderful. Uh, thank you for everybody who has already contributed some questions. We've been getting quite a few of them. So thank you. And please, we do encourage you that if you do have any questions, please submit them in the Q&A box and we will get to them in the order that they were received. So jumping right into it, uh, the first question that we received are what are the assumptions in the future prediction models of climate temperature? Amita? Ah, yes. Um, so uh, prediction models that um, there, there are several prediction models and they all have different assumptions. So I'm trying to understand your question specifically. Uh, if you look at CMIP five or six models, um, they all have um, different parameterizations and assumptions. When they look at climate projections for temperatures, they do use the same uh, boundary conditions. So that uh, much is common among all different models. But different models, they do have different assumptions in the sense that their procedures, their parameterizations, they kind of vary. So if if that's the uh, question, I'm, I'm trying to understand what specifically you want to know uh, about temperature, because when um, greenhouse gas scenario, aerosol scenarios, these are all prescribed and they are the same in all the models. And there's a huge uh, literature about that. Uh, we'll, we'll give you references for uh, links for that. Wonderful. And question two, uh, I'm wondering if it is possible to have a Python script to download Mara2 data. So for the user or for the multiple users that might have that same question, we provided a link uh, in the answer uh, to be able to go to the NASA Guest Disk webpage. And there you will find, uh, if you follow that link, you'll be able to download Mara2 data using a Python script. So hopefully that user will be able to take advantage of that. Question three, does Giovanni have API access? Uh, if anybody else can chime in, I'm not sure specifically for Giovanni, but uh, NASA does provide API for data set searches, and we provided a couple of different links below. But if anybody else, uh, any of the other trainers know specifically for Giovanni, uh, please unmute and speak up. I don't believe uh, Giovanni has API service, but um, um, for precipitation, uh, PMM has uh, API service, and then we'll provide link to that in a minute. But no, Giovanni specifically does not. Not that I'm aware of. Okay, thank you, Mita. 
and question four. How can we get fire count data of a particular place for a particular time? I believe, Pawan or Melanie, you can address this. I think we're talking about fire detection, right, in, in session three. Hi, this is Pawan. Um, uh, thanks, Amita. Yes, uh, so the fire counts uh, will be covered in session three, and we will get into details how to download the data and how to do the fire counts over a particular place or for a particular time. So stay tuned for session three. Great, thank you, Pawan. So please, uh, for everybody, please join us again for the uh, subsequent parts of this where you'll be learning a lot more about how to access fire count data as well as aerosols and uh, pre-vegetation during and post. So please stay tuned and, and keep joining all of these different parts of the webinar series. So question five, what is meant by the area average when temperature precipitation was shown? Is it for a particular county or for all of Northern California? Um, so that's a good question. If you look at the title, the seasonal time series, uh, they were averaged over entire state just to look at overall uh, climatological variations for four seasons. Uh, and so that's averaged over California. But when we looked at weather time series, that's um, MER2, humidity, temperature, and winds, they were on, on focused on that Northern California region that we saw in Worldview, where uh, most August fires were detected. So that's uh, that was that region. So that's when we say area average, that's what we meant. Great, thank you, Mita. Question six, how can we know the precise number of fires prior to the satellite era? Could it be that population growth is somehow associated with the increase in detected fires? I would say that before a satellite era, you only have to, uh, you know, if there are local fire stations or counties, they, they keep all the data, you can learn from that. Um, it is possible that as population, like um, you look at in California, I'm sure, and, and in Oregon, it's known that the regions where earlier there were no there was no population or no settlements now people are living there so more fires are affecting and that's a documented fact but to know how many fires occurred before satellite era you have you have to depend on uh, local information from local authorities great and question Anyone seven else? oh question seven what is the spatial resolution of the precipitation map for iMERGE. Uh, the spatial resolution for iMERGE is uh, 0 0.1 by 0 0.1 degrees, or that's roughly 10 by 10 kilometers. Question eight, how is anomaly calculated for 2020? Is it a deviation from decadal temperature, precipitation trend, or just the previous year? No, that was the anomalies were departures from mean 20, 2001 to 2020 mean. So those were the, when we showed mean maps, they were shown from 2001 to 2020. And then 2020 seasons, um, the climatology, that mean was subtracted from that. So it's, it's about 20 year mean. And question and nine. Molly's, uh, uh, 20 year mean. Mm -hmm. Question nine, how did you produce the graphs and maps for the California case study? So uh, that's a good question. Giovanni, when you do analysis like we showed, we actually produced uh, time series and maps in Giovanni, but we downloaded them as either GeoTIFF or CSV files. Um, and there are tutorials uh, about this um, that you can go through. We can provide you links how to do that. We downloaded uh, CSV files and um, made seasonal time series plots with uh, Excel and maps were were done in in QGIS. Um, the the weather time series that was taken directly from Giovanni. 
So it's a combination of data from Giovanni and using Excel and QGIS for um, plotting and analysis. Great, thank you, Amita. And question 10, can you explain how the iMERGE data indicates lightning potential? So that's a good question. But what we uh, said that if you look at that month of August, there was no rain, just that one rain event just before the fire started. Now from ground observations, they, they know, they reported that it was the lightning spark that started the fire. So when we looked at iMERGE, it coincided with beginning of that fire complex um, activities. And so, so we, are, we are referring that, you know, just looking at iMERGE, um, it, it looks like, yes, there is a potential for lightning. Now we cannot confirm just by looking at iMERGE data that there is lightning or there, there will be lightning. So that was not the point. The point was that it sort of coincided with when lightning was noted from, from ground and when the fire started. So that, that, that coincidence was shown in the time series. Now there are um, lightning data sets, available, lightning information available from NOAA as well as um, I believe International Space Station has a lightning detector. We could not find coincident data over California for that particular fire um, complex. Um, but one might also look at um, clouds from MODIS, look at um, um, tall clouds, which may signify lightning, uh, especially when cloud tops are so higher that it's, it's frozen up there then it indicates lightning. So one can look at uh, clouds to, to get more lightning probability. So iMERGE, um, unfortunately, we cannot say that it's associated with lightning, but what we were showing was more or less coincidence between um, when fire started and when, when there was precipitation. That was the only event we saw that month. Great, thank you, Amita. And question number 11, uh, thanks for the useful case explanation in California. Well, thank you to whoever gave that. Uh, we appreciate the thanks. In the case of a spike of precipitation before the fire event, does the moisture anomaly from SMAP detect some positive moisture anomalies? So uh, that is also a good question. We haven't looked at SMAP anomalies for this case, but uh, we can check and get back to you on that one. Um, so, um, you are talking about the, the high resolution, high temporal resolution time series. That's, you're asking for soil moisture anomalies just before that precipitation. We will see that, what we see. We saw seasonal anomalies uh, from GLDAS that clearly showed negative anomalies that is drying. Um, of in, in Northern California. But just before um, precipitation, we'll see the fire. We haven't seen that. Thank you. Great. And question number 12. Can remote sensing techniques be used to detect smoke from charcoal burning? In Malawi, there's a lot of deforestation due to charcoal production. I was wondering if NASA products could be used to identify areas where charcoal production is common, but are hard to reach. Um, I would say, Pawan or Melanie, you can address that. I think sessions three and four will we'll talk more about uh, fire and smoke detection. Yeah, this is Pawan again. Uh, Thanks, Amita. I, I think uh, we will try to cover some of these in session three. Uh, although we don't specifically talk about charcoal fires, uh, but it really depends on how big area it is burning and at what level of uh, intense those fires are. And depending on the amount of smoke, uh, so it may or may not be possible. Um, if you have a specific detail, you can send us an email the time period when these things happen and we can check back on and pro can provide a little bit more in-depth details. Great, thank you, Amita, and for Pawan for contributing to that. 
Um, okay. Question number 13. Is there, is there anything other than the spike in 30 minute precipitation to suggest lightning was the cause? Um, not really, not from what we saw from satellites. This was reported from ground observations that lightning was the cause of start of that fire. And so this was just showing the coincidence, coincidence between that one iMERGE event that we saw and um, that was just before the fire started. So, you know, just kind of referring to that, that it's possible that there were clouds and lightning. But just by looking at iMERGE, no, it, it cannot confirm that, yes, lightning was there. Great, question 14. How big should the fire be to be detected by satellites? So to answer this, it's kind of a long wordy one, but uh, satellites take a snapshot of events as they pass over the earth, as they orbit. Each hotspot or active fire detection represents the center of a pixel and it's flagged as containing one or more fires or other thermal anomalies, uh, in this case, such as volcanoes. For MODIS, uh, this is uh, on the Terra and Aqua satellites, the pixel is approximately one kilometer. And for VIRS, the pixel is approximately 375 meters. The location is the center point of the pixel, but not necessarily the coordinates of the actual fire. So it's really the centroid of that pixel. The actual pixel size varies with the scan and the track. And the fire is often less than the size of the pixel. So we are not able to determine the exact fire size. What we do know is that at least one fire is located within the flagged pixel. So hopefully that provides some clarification to whoever asked that question. And question 15, does the data collection cover the globe? For instance, if I was interested in Iraq, will I be able to find data? Uh, so to uh, our participant from Iraq or somewhere in the Middle East, yes, the data, everything we described today is uh, is global in coverage. Uh, and for uh, GPM, it's nearly global and definitely covers all of the Middle East uh, and in and definitely Iraq, and if that is your specific study area. So absolutely. And we encourage you to go to all the different websites that we provided today to be able to explore the data and download for your study area. Question 16. I may have missed it, but how is the burned area index, BAI, used to assess pre-fire conditions? What does the burned area index indicate? Very good question. Uh, burned area index would indicate a post-burn scenario. And of course, this is a pre-fire training. Uh, the reason that we described the burned area index, it was to really showcase the full functionality of climate engine. Um, so hopefully we didn't confuse anybody in that. We just wanted to show that, yes, you can assess pre-fire conditions using Climate Engine, but there are also some really neat variables that you can plug into the tool to also be able to assess burned area index. And specifically what burned area index is, it indicates burned area in both the red and near infrared spectrum, and it emphasizes the charcoal signal and post-fire images. Uh, the index is computed from the spectral distance from each pixel to a reference spectral point where recently burned areas converge. And in, as, as we showed in Climate Engine, the brighter pixels indicate uh, the burned areas. So uh, hopefully that answered that question. Question 17, are any live monitoring fire websites available? Uh, the answer is yes. NASA provides the Fire Information for Resource Management System, or FIRMS. And this is for near real-time active fire data within three hours of a satellite overpass from both the MODIS and the VIRS uh, instruments on these different platforms that are listed, Aquaterra and also uh, Suomi NPP and NOAA 20. Uh, and for that person that was very interested in, say, live monitoring fire websites, please do stay tuned. Uh, join us in uh, parts uh, three, four. We will be discussing firms much more in following parts of this webinar and showcasing firms uh, it, within the webinar series. But as this is a pre-fire uh, training, we did want to emphasize the uh, pre-fire components, but please do stay tuned. And we did provide the link below if you wanted to get a, a head start and start exploring that website, we do encourage you to do so. Uh, question 18. The chart you show for the NFDRS is outdated. See NFDRS 2016 for a new update. Um, Robert, did you want to chime in? Um, yeah, thanks for pointing that out. I've put a, uh, a link to the website for NFDR 2016 in the, uh, the Q&A document. Thanks. 
Wonderful. And I think the next few ones are going to be for Robert. But how is the fire weather index calibrated for different regions? Uh, that is done through a uh, combination of uh, historical analyses, field studies, lab experiments, and ultimately expert judgment. Uh, and I provided a uh, website. And if you go, go down, the second table has a list of examples of how that's been done for different uh, fire, envir fire environments around the world. Great. And question 21. So just wondering how one can calculate these fire indices. Is there a formula to plug in uh, T, R, H, and wind speed, et cetera? Uh, yeah, the equations are described in uh, several several publications, uh, one of which is from the Canadian Forest Service, where the FWI system was development um, from 1987, and a more recent publication uh, that just takes it has the same math but takes a different approach to describing the equations from a report a report from the Australian. Um, for research council uh the canadian forest service also provides code in fortran c python uh, java and a couple of other programming languages if if you want to just use that directly wonderful thank you robert uh okay question 22 if you can scroll down thank you how can I get all this weather data into WMS or WMTS service? Um, I'm assuming by WMS, that's meaning uh, web mapping service, and uh, and I'm not sure. All of the data are provided in net CDF files, so getting them into an external uh, web mapping service or, or any kind of visu vis visualization platform, I guess, depends on um, their ability to um, handle net CDF data. Great. And question 23. Slide number 87 is wonderful. Thank you for whoever gave us that question. It's good to get that feedback. Just wondering how one can make uh, such maps and graphs. Um, yeah, thank you for saying that. That was made uh, using two files. Um, that I've provided links to in the Q&A document. The, all of that fire weather data, there are daily data and then monthly averages and then longer term monthly averages, usually over the length of the um, period that the data are available for, which in some cases is shorter than a, a, a more typical 30 year climate normal. So you can get, so that map was made from two files and then using the Panoply software from my lab uh nasa guess the link to which is also in the q a document and panoply is great and and in that case it was made from loading two files and making a, a simple difference map great thank you robert uh question 24 uh can we just use fire weather index data instead of using individual pre-fire weather variables data um, I would say both are worth considering. Relative humidity, for example, is is not a bad starting point as a um, as sort of an ad hoc measure of fire danger uh, or antecedent precipitation. Um, so they're always worth looking at in any comparison, for example, uh, against the FWI's ability to explain, say, fire activity. Um, and then other danger rating systems such as the NFDRS, the old NFDRS, NFDR 26, NFDRS 2016, or the MacArthur indices from Australia, are um, are also worth considering, but are uh, are less ubiquitous than the FWI system. Wonderful. And question 25: Fire can have a serious impact on power transmission when too close to this facility. Any approach on how the uh, FWI index can be used to infer an impact on power transmission lines? Um, yeah, the, the FWI system components on their own are, are used um, after local calibration, really to capture fuel dryness and potential fire behavior. 
in theory, these can be combined with um, value, say, call them values at risk information like um, power line transition, uh, transmission locations. And this is more in a wildfire threat sense uh, to identify power lines in regions of high fire danger. Uh, but the FWI system on its own is only meant to track uh, really fuel moisture and potential fire behavior. Great, and question 26. How does the low high humidity affect the fire given low precipitation conditions? It's that uh, humidity is a critical control on, um, on fuel moisture, especially for light, uh, light fuels such as pine needles, uh, leaf litter and, um, and dead grass, either, either tracked through relative humidity or vapor pressure deficit. Wonderful, and uh, thank you, Robert. Question 27, I think fire weather index is derived from reanalysis data. If so, how different are uh, uh, ERA-5 and MERA-2 FWI products? That's a really good question. Um, I don't know of a, a direct comparison between the two products, uh, mostly because they're both not really more than a year old, um, but I will point out that the, the near real-time analysis version, so not Reanalysis, but um, but the FWI numbers calculated from uh, NWP models uh, can be compared uh, visual at least on the uh, GWIS platform um, that we'll hear that we've heard a bit about and we'll hear more about in uh, subsequent um, uh, seminars. The GWIS uh, posts both the e the ECMWF FWI data and then data uh, FWI data from NASA's GEOS 5, both of which are based or, or use the same model as ERA 5 and MERA 2. Great. Question 28. Which decisions can be taken by using a daily fire hazard index? Um, that depends on your local fire management needs. And I'll just refer to a, a paper that um, that provides discussions uh, of all of those and compares different uh, danger rating systems um, and how they're used in different parts of the world. That is the uh, De Groot 2015 paper that I think is listed on slide um, 78 and the link to which is, or the, the citation for which is in the uh, Q&A document. And question 29, is active remote sensing data used for assessing fire danger? Uh, do you value data from synthetic aperture radars? Will that be discussed in next sessions? Um, I'll defer to others on that if, if somebody else wants to take it. But in the meantime, I will just point out that, oh, sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. So SAR can um, monitor vegetation, and so that way it can be useful. Um, there's a paper that I just put a link to. Uh, it, it it monitors uh, fire progress um, using SAR. So in in research areas, SAR has been used. Um, we will not be covering SAR in this webinar. I'll just um, point out also that on slide 78, uh, I've, I've listed a paper, the Pedinari and Chivieco 2020 paper that provides an overview of other approaches to fire danger rating um, uh, from space-borne instruments, which does include um, active instruments, um, including SAR. All right, in question 30, how would you process the Canadian FWI index in a program such as ArcGIS using interpolation techniques for the variables? Would you recommend using ArcGIS or do you rather use a different program? Um, I would have to defer to others on, on, on preferred uh, GIS platforms, but it isn't, it's common, I, and I don't, I'm not sure if ArcGIS's ability to uh, for this data at least to, to handle net CDF data, but it is common to uh, take raw weather station data, use the interpolation programs in the, uh, in the GIS to make maps from weather station data, which presumably could be done for, 
gridded data also, but I'm not familiar enough with the software to, to give a good answer. Great, thank you, Robert. Um, for all the attendees, we really appreciate it. We know that we've gone over the hour. We're five minutes over the hour. Um, we want to encourage all of you to check back uh, to our website where we'll be posting all of the answers to the question in a uh, question and answer document. We'll be posting that to the part one of this webinar series. So you'll be able to go to the RSET website and access that in another week once we have a chance to go through and finish answering and cleaning it up, we will post it. So if we did not get to your question today, uh, uh, rest assured that we will address it and we will post that to the RSET website. We also want to encourage everybody to join us uh, this Thursday and two days from now at the exact same time where we're we going to be hearing about satellites and sensors for pre-fire vegetation-based wildfire applications. So please do join us for part two of the six-part webinar series in two days from now this Thursday. We hope you all come back to join us then. Uh, and again, please do uh, keep checking on the website if you have any questions for uh, materials, for handouts, everything else. Uh, the homework will also be posted there. Uh, in closing, I, I just want to thank everybody that took part from the RSET team on this training. Uh, that's Sel Selwyn hudson Odoy, Jonathan O'Brien, Brock Levins, Amita Mekta, uh, Erica Potis, Paul and Gupta, uh, uh, Zachary Bankston, uh, uh, Melanie Fullett Cook, uh, Juan Torres Perez, uh, and if I'm uh, Robert Field, uh, and, and everybody else that contributed to this. Uh, we do hope you'll come back and join us in on Thursday, and we wish you all a wonderful day. So thank you. <laughs>